Um, but so this session is called Digital Project-Based Learning in the Humanities and Social Sciences. Uh, Project-based learning has a long history as a means of organizing a course around active and engaging pedagogies. In this session, presenters explore ways that digital technologies can support a project-based approach in social sciences and humanities. Stand behind the podium, the speaker should pick you up there, or the microphone should pick you up there. Okay, Professor Leah Niederstadt and Professor Claire Buck of Wheaton College will discuss two different courses that used Omeka to create research projects. These case studies will highlight some of the challenges and successes in using Omeka and object-based learning for course-based assignments. I will actually stay behind the podium because a few years ago one of my students shamed me into not printing out my PowerPoint notes so they're all embedded into my laptop. So today Claire and I are going to share with you two examples of object-based and project-based um, uh, projects or assignments that we used um, in our courses using Omeka, which is an online content management platform for those of you who are not familiar with it. And the projects re relied on multiple collaborations between faculty, staff, and students at several different levels. It also required faculty and students to learn new technology, and the students were forced to engage with a research process that is often circuitous and ambiguous and uh, complex. And they had to engage with both primary and secondary sources from resources on Wheaton's campus and off campus as well. For those of you who aren't familiar with Wheaton College, it's a small liberal arts college located in southeastern Massachusetts, approximately 1,600 students. And for those of you American Idol fans, the uh, current winner of American Idol is actually a member of the class of 2008. So Wheaton's president recently quipped that our tagline should be Wheaton College uh, American Idol, Major League Baseball players, and Rhodes Scholars, we've got it all. <laughs> what we do not have, however, is a museum. We do have an academic teaching collection. The origins of the collection trace back to 1834, when Wheaton Female Seminary was founded. Uh, so the college, when the college was founded, the Wheaton family gave portraits of themselves because, of course, they wanted to be identified as the founders of the institution. And they gave paintings of landscapes. And over time, the collection grew and grew and grew. But it was never identified as a collection until 1974, when it was compiled from collections all over campus, in basements and garages and closets and attics, you name it, they found objects there. It is approximately 6,000 objects that we know of. It's very eclectic, encyclopedic on a very small scale. And it's everything from Greco-Roman and Egyptian antiquities to 21st century contemporary art. In my role as a faculty member, I'm also curator of the permanent collection, and I engage with object-based learning in every single one of my classes, but I also try to engage my faculty colleagues in doing the same. So in the spring of 2013, I received an inquiry from the Frick Collection, which is based in New York City, and they were trying to track a particular painting that they believed to be in Wheaton's collection. And because our collection has never been fully inventoried, let alone cataloged, we are constantly learning new information about the objects and the donors and the artists associated with the collection. So in particular, they were asking about a painting that we knew as Audrey the Shepherd Lass. It depicts a Dutch shepherdish, shepherdess who is knitting a sock while she's ignoring the flock of goats in the landscape behind her. And we knew that it was in the collection of Potter and Bertha Palmer. Those of you from Chicago may know the Palmers. He founded Marshall Fields, and he also uh, established the Lakeshore Drive in Chicago. They were avid art collectors. They were also very actively involved in the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. And somehow, through this long story, the painting ended up at Wheaton. And through the Frick Collection inquiry, we actually learned the entire provenance or history of ownership of the painting. So we now knew everywhere that the painting had been and who had owned it. And while I professionally found that really fascinating, what most fascinated my work study students was the image of the painting actually hanging in one of the salons of the Palmer Mansion, which is no longer extant in Chicago. And so I thought, well, this might be a really interesting project to do with students. So in the summer of 2013, I received a grant from our provost office to create a first year seminar that involved blended learning. And the project that I assigned to the students was to do research, provenance research, on objects from Wheaton's collection. They were divided into teams because our first year seminar is supposed to encourage collaborative learning for the students. And they had to engage in um, research using primary sources and secondary sources, using resources both on and off campus. 
They also had to learn to new technologies. And very selfishly, it, for me, it was a form of service learning because it increased documentation on the collection. The only professional staffing for the collection is half of my tenure track line and a bunch of work study students who are amazing, but they are work study students who are not professionally trained in museum work. So the students took on these projects in teams, and the way in which they presented their research was through the creation of digital maps using Google Earth. The students used the maps to present their research, and I did this intentionally because I wanted them to be able to show the movement of the objects over space and time, so that you could see that Herbal Hasseltine's Philly was created in France, it then went to New York City, it then went to Florida, and then somehow it ended up at Eaton College. We did a standard course evaluation of the project, and the students check off a Likert scale, but then they also have a free form field where they can write in whatever they like. And 42% of the students unprompted said that they really love this project because of the research involved, the object-based learning involved, and the fact that it created something that they felt had a real world of impact, that they were contributing to the collection. In the spring semester, we surveyed them using Google uh, Forms, and it was anonymous. And of the students who responded, 86% of them said that they would much prefer to do this kind of project than to write a traditional research paper. However, yeah. <laughs> However, they hated Google Maps. They said it was clunky, it was intuitive, and it was annoying. And my most tech-savvy student actually was miserable with it, I think in part because he was so tech-savvy. So in the spring 2014 semester, for my Introduction to Museum Studies course, I had the students again do provenance research, but they did so independently. So instead of five objects, there were 18. Again, very mercenary on my part, more documentation on the collection. And they still had to do research using primary and secondary sources, but they had the entire semester to complete the project. I'm manipulating two screens here, it's great. So instead of using Google Earth, because the students hated that in the FYS, I decided to try Omeka. That was suggested to me by colleagues in Library and Information Services. And there was then a staff member, an assistant archivist, who had some expertise with Omeka and was willing to train me and willing to train the students. It would also be the first use of Omeka on campus, and so I wanted to trial that and be the person who could say I had trialed that with my students. And very importantly, Omeka can be made publicly accessible. So people outside of Wheaton can learn about the objects that we have in the collection. The donors who are still living can see that their objects are being used. And the students can refer to the projects and show uh, employers, graduate schools, et cetera, the kind of work that they've done. Oh, great. Now it's stuck. I'm just going to click. There we go. Okay. So, um, I, there we go. Sorry, I went ahead of myself. They, uh, again, had to engage with primary and secondary sources. So they were using archives on campus. They were engaging with microfiche in the development office that had been down there for 100 years, or however long microfiche had been invented. They were doing research <laughs> in the collection. They were working with photographs. They were working with original documents. And they were reaching out to institutions around the world to try and track the provenance of these objects. They also did mapping. We used the mapping plugin that is associated with Omeka. But unfortunately, it didn't provide this fluid global arching view that you would get with the Google Earth maps where you would actually see the movement of the cursor across the globe as the object moved back and forth. There is an, a, a, a tool suite associated with Omeka called Neatline, but that needs to be hosted on a server on your campus, and uh, Wheaton was not willing or able to do that at the time, so I paid a fee to use Omeka on um, campus. And I paid for that on my collection budget, and I have to maintain that every year or I lose access to the material the students created. Mm -hmm. So in terms of some of the oops factors that we um, ran into with this, we um, neither Megan Wheaton Book, our assistant archivist, nor I were expertise in Omeka, nor were the students. So we were learning together, and it was very much collaborative learning. And we would figure things out, or the students would figure things out, and we would be able to sort of make it work together. We wanted also to do this intentionally, modeling this for the students, because it's important that for them to realize, and this has been a theme throughout the conference today, that they are engaged in their learning, and it's not just me standing up there as the expert telling them the learning goes in both directions. We also um, had some copyright and source challenges because some students found it difficult to identify images that were in the public domain, and so they struggled with that. And they also found, much like Google Earth Maps, they found uh, Omeka clunky, annoying, and not very intuitive. 
We also ran into a challenge in that the students had to have administrator level status in Omeka in order to create the pages and upload the images and upload the text to create the exhibition. Again, that was very intentional. We wanted them to be actively engaged in the process, but that meant that when we were having the original Omeka workshop, one of them deleted the example that we had set up as a model, and so we had to very quickly sort of recreate it so they would have the model to work with. And we emphasized to them, you need to be extremely careful because you can delete your colleagues' work, and because it's not posted on our server, we have no way to get that information back. We also had um, a result that was more broadly associated with provenance research. For those of you who have any expertise in museums or association with museums, there are very thorny issues embedded, embedded in provenance. And so, for example, my students discovered that some of our donors had committed tax fraud and <laughs> that objects had been looted. Every single individual associated with this amphora here has been indicted and or jailed for art fraud. <laughs> Great teaching opportunity. <laughs> uh, Jillian is going with me to Italy if we ever have to repatriate this amphora. However, I want to make these sites publicly accessible, and it's somewhat challenging if some of these individuals and or the gallery from which we purchased this amphora are still alive and or active. So um, those are some of the challenges that we ran into. In addition, this kind of research for some students, very, very few students, is very challenging because it is a situation in which, in some ways, they have to learn how to fail. So if you're reading this comment, this was by far the student who hated this project the worst over three semesters of teaching it, and found it very, very difficult to understand how I could possibly evaluate him as a student when I had no idea what he would find in the process. And one of the ways in which we did this is that the assignment was divided up into steps, some of which were graded and some of which were not, and they had to keep a research log. And so it was very clear to me if you were actually doing the work and when you were looking for research and resources and who you were consulting and what you might have found. He earned the worst grade on this project I have had to give a student because he did not actually engage in the process and do the work. However, oops, wrong, wrong one, sorry. Yi Tong Tsai, who's a member of the class of 2015, she's actually a psychology major, she earned one of the highest grades in the course because she proved to us what she was doing throughout the course of the project to try and identify the provenance, but we still have no idea what this object is. <laughs> we don't know what it is. The only thing we learned in addition to what we already knew was the fact that Samuel Elbert, who's a linguist at the University of Hawaii, had acquired it somehow from Japan and had given it to his sister, who was a Wheaton librarian, married to a Wheaton professor. The couple then gave it to Wheaton, and that's how it ended up there. She consulted with experts in China, experts in Japan, experts in Hawaii. Again, we still don't even know what this object is. However, you know, she says, I can tell you, she earned an A on the project because she actually engaged with the process and did the work. <laughs> and in the end, again, we did um, the standard course evaluation as well as pre-project testing and post-project testing. And I hit the wrong button again. I'm so sorry. Go. And what we found is that um, for the students, the majority of them preferred this to a traditional research project because of the object-based learning. They get to handle real things. They get to work with real objects and real documents. They have to learn how to read 19th century handwriting, you know, all those kinds of things. They also are able to use it as an example for employers and graduate schools of collaborative learning, of engaging in a very real-world research project and will actually have something that they can show to those individuals as evidence of their work. And in many instances, they became obsessed. So I still have students who have graduated who email me and say, I was looking up Mrs. Richardson and I found her house on Commonwealth Avenue in Boston, and here's an image of it. Or in this case, Sarah Hilton, who's our incoming student government association president, has now basically mapped the entire provenance of this portrait, which is a William Merritt Chase painting of Lillian Westcott Hale, and has even um, tracked down the, the marriage certificates of some of the owners and wedding photographs, et cetera, et cetera. And she is still obsessed with it, still working on it. We were at Smith College about a week ago trying to learn why, how the painting actually got created because it never ended up in the Hale family. William Merritt Chase sort of hung on to it himself. So the project was successful in terms of the learning outcomes from my perspective. And from the student perspective, it was also um, very successful. I'm now going to turn the floor over to Claire, uh, my colleague in the English department. And I shanghaied her into doing a project using the collection because, of course, that's the other half of my um, job at Wheaton.
Hi. Um, so I'm just going to do a very abbreviated um, introduction to what I to what I did with the students. So, um, as Leah said, she um, she persuaded me because I wanted to do an exhibition um, with my students um, because I was teaching a first year seminar on the subject of the First World War in fall 2014 in the centenary year. So exhibition seemed the way to go. Um, and. Um, and why is it not doing anything? It's, click on the slide, maybe. I'll see yeah, on my email. There we go. So, okay. there we go. so we did an online poster project using um, Omega. And um, the students um, worked in pairs. They, um, it's very obvious what they did. They curated an exhibition of three First World War posters, one of which was from the Wheaton Collection. And they worked with that with the actual artifact, the very large, very gorgeous posters. And then um, they, from, they're very fragile. And so from then on, they worked with a digital image. And they had to gather two more um, uh, images of posters from other sources of campus, write object descriptions, an introduction, framing their exhibit in three posters, and then um, uh, upload this all to um, Omega. Um, and um, with the metadata. And they did in class presentations. They did a presentation at the end, but they also presented uh, practically every two weeks on where they were. So they were constantly working through um, what they were doing outside of class. The assignment goals um, are somewhat obvious, really. Um, and they were the goals for the course, really, um, that uh, because students are coming into Wheaton very often, very focused on the idea of the um, uh, of um, very focused on the idea that their um, faculty member sets expectations, the conventions and criteria for what they do. The faculty member um, they're working towards um, a sort of homework assignment. Their idea of work is that it should be um, what they're supposed to give in or what they're supposed to do for an assignment. So this was something where I was encouraging them and forcing them really to. Um, research and write um, across the entire uh, semester towards it in this very open-ended way. Um, also, from the very beginning, I wanted them to think in terms of information fluency um, as something that, um, as Leah said, cross multiple um, cross multiple media from documents and artifacts through print books to um, scholarly databases and other web sources. Um, and that that should be very much about their first year, ex first semester, first year experience. And um, collaborative learning was huge for this. Their use of Google Docs and Omega as ways of getting them to learn the value of working together. And again, huge was reimagining the writing, uh, what writing was. I wanted them to not think, come into college with the idea that writing was about writing papers. I wanted them to be thinking of writing in different contexts. So um, I just want to show you an example of what I consider the success with their writing. So this is a very dense piece of text, I know, but um, I really only want you to look at a couple of bits. This was um, a group's first draft of um, their topic was national infantry. and they, you'll see that the bits I've marked in orange are signs of the novice writer, so that they haven't got a sense of the genre. They're doing, and we've seen some other examples of this today already, that um, you know, they're telling us what they're doing. In our curation project, we examined. Um, through the research and observation, we noted. So it's like a report. Um, you see in blue, I've given you just a couple of mechanical things that are, where they're um, there are many mechanical things, and that's fine because it's a draft, but the, they haven't got accents on um, the, t the titles there on Supreme and Societe Generale. Um, but also, if you notice, there are two numerals the, in red, red in one and two, and you see um, that they're, they've got a, a kind of logic going, um, almost like a paper logic rather than an object description logic, and they... Um, but they've done what people said earlier with a data dump. It's, they've put everything into this paragraph. But nonetheless, there's an emergent logic. 
the final version, their opening paragraph, this pair, and this pair was not, um, there was one very skilled writer, but not very experienced, and the other student was not such a strong writer at all. So, but here we see, I think, amazing success a month later. During World War I, 1914-1918, communication between the front line and civilian line was critical. You can, you can hear immediately, they're moving in through the topic, the issues, and they've got the notion of the genre. No more first person, no more telling us we did this, we did that. Um, if we go back a minute to the previous draft, that first draft, and this is all on Google Docs, and I want you to understand that this is their collaborative process, it was their collaborative um, play space, if you like. They put their object descriptions, when they began looking at the posters, um, they, each student had to um, generate their own individual um, description, and then as a pair, they had to create a single description for me, which became the basis of their final version. They had to co-write together their introduction, and then, the, then each one individually was responsible for one of the other two posters, but they had to together edit and make sure that they had got it right. And this was all documented along with their research on Google Docs. You see in their original version of the, um, this was point two of their original introduction, where um, you see them, they've just got this idea, all right, these three posters are gathered together under this idea of helmets, um, different kinds of helmets. The final version, which as you see in blue, they've got the accents on, um, but they also, you know, it, in what is a very nicely orchestrated paragraph, you see at the end, um, in all three posters, the men don the appropriate mass-produced helmet for that time period. The French wearing Adrian helmets and the Germans wearing, German wearing a Stahlhelm helmet. In the last poster, um, a more ornate Pickelhauer helmet. So they, they've got their density of research, they have started their, their writing in a much more, I mean, in a really very proficient way. So just to, um, I'm, I'm about out of time, but if I just go, I'll give you an example of that last, um, well, let me tell you one of the two main points. One is the metadata. The students wrestled with Omega. It was indeed clunky. And the, um, one of the ways in which they wrestled was with the putting in the metadata. They hated putting in the metadata. <laughs> but for me, it, it was huge. It was about persistence with the technology. It really shouldn't have been that difficult, but they were determined it was difficult. <laughs> but also, it was that they, at that point, they started to really learn that the expectations and standards did not belong with me. They belonged with the platform, and they belonged with um, the weekend collection um, and Leah. And so we had this movement away from the sense of there's this eccentric professor who just wants me to do something. <laughs> and you see this is what the metadata looks like in one of the images. Mm -hmm. But I want to conclude with one last point, which was the, the final, um, this is a different um, exhibition, two different students. This was another aspect of the project where my senior seminar that semester, the students were, had to mentor the first year students. And the student who mentored the pair who did this poster and this exhibition was an art history and English double major. I'm an English professor. Um, and um, she indeed pushed their writing and she pushed their research and she pushed their depths of analysis. But what was most interesting, I think, for, for me was that um, we saw her also teach them the conventions of art historical um, writing so that you see, and this is very much the last thing, the poster is divided into two rectangles, the top rectangle is, and so you start to see the genre conventions coming from someone other than me so that they were moving in this direction in this really interesting way. And I've promised, and I think this is the only reason that Leah asked me to do this, that the books factor was on the, in exam week, I deleted the exhibition. It actually pressed a button and it was gone. Oh, <laughs> and, oh. um, and you can ask questions afterwards about what happened, but, I, <laughs> but it taught me, what it taught me was the independent learning from the, I, and the wrestling and the persistence that my students, I think, um, that I wanted for my students.